Hello and welcome to Workplace Makers with Nina Fountain. This is the podcast that gets to know the people creating workplaces we aspire to. It's about achieving the ultimate win, a workplace people are drawn to wherever they work from, and discovering how we can remove limitations to enable people to be their best through workplace innovation and design. I'm your host, modern workplace consultant, Nina Fountain. Join me as I unlock the secrets of attractive, productive, and engaging modern workplaces. Welcome to the Workplace Makers podcast. Today, we are joined by Shashir Mahotra, and Shashir is the co-founder and CEO of Coda, an all-in-one doc for teams that combines documents, spreadsheets, and powerful building blocks into a single canvas. And Shashir was formerly an executive at YouTube as vice president of product engineering and user experience. And over that six-year tenure, his six-year tenure there, he helped grow YouTube to the world's largest video destination. Prior to Google and that role, Shashir spent six years at Microsoft, and before that, he was the founding CEO of Centrata, and he's currently a board member of Spotify. So Shashir, welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, great. Great to be here. Um, it's fun to be connected and really excited to uh, for our chat today. Yeah, it'll be so great to dig into your experience. You lead companies in technology, and our the podcast, the Workplace Makers podcast, is focused on on leaders building workplaces that their people want to be a part of. So we're coming from, in some ways, different worlds, but as a senior executive leading a distributed first company, you have really significant experience in bringing the modern workplace to life. So I'm really excited to dig into that and learn about uh, your your views on the modern workplace, team rituals, your leadership journey, and your and your view on AI as well. And um, just to set Coda in context, it's an exciting platform by the sound of it that can be used as a wiki, database, or a project management tool. And Coda as a company is now valued at 1.4 billion, if I've got that right, and used by over 50,000 teams around the world. And so what's it been like for you as a leader overseeing that growth? What's, what's that journey been like? Yeah, maybe. And so for me, it's a total dream job. And I think I think there is a, uh, you know, some people start companies out of opportunity, some start them out of obligation. Uh, this is definitely a, this is the company where the, the idea, idea for the company and what I wanted to build and so on was just so, I was so deeply connected to it that I had to start the company. And maybe as small background on it, before starting Code, as you mentioned, I used to run the YouTube team at, at Google. And, uh, you know, one of the things we saw was that even though there was a sort of world of applications out there, we tended to run teams on docs, spreadsheets, uh, presentations, so on, all these horizontal productivity tools. And we used to be kind of embarrassed about it that, you know, I had this executive join the team once and I was doing my one week check in and, and I said, uh, so what are your observations on YouTube? And he said, well, lots of observations on this and the strategy and so on. But he said, one thing I've like, so strange to me is you guys like barely use any applications. You do everything in doc sheets and slides. And, and I said, is that a positive or a negative? He's like, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. So you get together <laughs> the following week. And I said, you know, I've come to my conclusion. I think it's a positive. And the reason is very simple. You know, for example, we did, you know, the way we did planning. We didn't like the way Google does this thing called OKRs. We didn't love how they did it. We did it our own way. Or we like the way we did compensation. I have lots of opinions on, on compensation. We did this thing we call level independent compensation, which um, Google kind of gave us enough room to go run with, but we had to run it in our own doc sheets and slides. And probably the most famous example is if you flag a video on YouTube for a long time, it created a row in a spreadsheet on an ops person's desk. And so I'm talking to this executive. I said, you know what? I've decided I think this is actually a big strength of ours. And the reason is we get to run exactly the way we want. We are hiring the people we want to hire because I can compensate them the way they want. I can plan the way we want. We can be agile as the world changes around content moderation and flagging. And so and obviously it's changed even more in the last few years. Uh, and so I think that we run on docs, not apps, and it's better. We That's actually a positive. And so when I was getting ready to think about my next thing and I started thinking about what's what's different in the world and how do we think about things? You know, YouTube had imbe embedded this creator mindset in me. Like we'd, I'd gotten to see this amazing community of people that people honestly underestimated YouTubers for years. And we got to see that given the right platform, they could actually broadcast themselves to the world and change the world around them. 
And with Coda, I said, you know, I bet if we started with a slightly different blinking cursor, if we change these tools just a little bit, we'd probably get to a better place. I mean, one thing people don't realize about documents, spreadsheets, and presentations is that they're basically the same as they were in the 1970s. We've changed very little from these surfaces. So I said, what if we started from scratch and built a whole new tool? And so I talked to Alex, who ended up becoming my co-founder on this journey. And once I had it in my head, you know, I was talking to my wife about it and you know, Google wanted me to stay and do this other thing and I had these other other opportunities elsewhere. And I said, you know, I'm going to start this company with Alex and we're going to go build a new document. And she said, yeah, I knew you were going to do that. And I said, how did you know? She said, well, because every free moment you have, you're spending time working on this dumb idea. And like, no, she's been now very supportive of it. But at the time, it seemed a little crazy. Like, why would anybody need a document? But it's one of those things that once I could picture it, we just had to build it. So it's a tiny version of the Coda story. Fantastic. And having and being the leader of that organization now, which is, mm. is quite um, significant, the presence that you've got in the, and the, the profile yeah. built. Um, what is, what's, you know, what wakes you up in the morning with a, you know, is there a challenge on your mind um, in the morning where you think, you know, today, this is, this is who I need to be, or this is where, what I need to, to face. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, every day is a little different and uh, you know, one of the, the, one of the, the most fun parts of my job is waking up to the new challenge of every day. Um, you know, I think some days it's, some days it's product and design. You know, I spent a while this morning working on a, a particularly tricky design problem on something like, I think customers request a lot and we're sort of wrestling with how to get it done in a way that still makes sense with the rest of how Coda is structured. You know, sometimes it's interesting people or opportunities. I've been, uh, hiring into a, a new role in our marketing team. So I've been spending a lot of time with with candidates and learning about their backgrounds. And, you know, you get to meet all these people. Uh, last week I was in New York most of the week and I spent most of the time with customers. Um, I also sit on the board of Spotify, so I, I spent a bunch of time there as well. And um, just, you know, spending time with customers for Code is really fun because each one is is its own different, you know, own different story. And Code is this very horizontal product, so it can help people in so many different ways. Um, and so for some customers, we spend all our time talking about, you know, these days a lot of customers working on do more with less. And, you know, what what is what's possible, you know, when budgets are constrained, people are constrained, so on. There's others that are really interested in distributed teams, which I know we'll talk more about uh, about here, is that the new reality of we all got this sort of fast forward to the future of, COVID hit and we all became distributed teams and everybody is snapping back at different rates. And, you know, some are sort of staying with what they were, they were, and some of some snapped all the way back to what they were before. And some are halfway in between and figuring things out. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing it? Uh, and then, and then, you know, one topic I love spending time on is, is rituals and how, how teams operate and, and what makes them, what makes them unique, which I know is one of the topics you want to talk about here as well. So yeah, I would love stay to more with that in a minute. Into, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Into teams and, and rituals of teams. And yeah. um, a great moment in, to mention the fact that you're writing a book with a similar title. Is it called The Rituals of Great Teams? That's right, Rituals of Great Teams. And so what, what catalyzed your interest in, in this area? How did you, um, did you have a moment where you suddenly thought, yeah, rituals, rituals of teams. There's, there's something here I, I want to write about. Yeah, actually, interestingly, it started on a podcast. I have a lot of allegiance to podcasts. So um, although the the early in the pandemic, I did uh, a podcast with Reed Hoffman on Masters of Scale. And uh, and the way they record it is so entertaining because they you sit down. They don't tell you what they want to talk about. Reed refuses to give you questions in advance. And so you sit and talk for three hours and they somehow make a 30 minute episode out of it. And the editors are amazing. And so they snip it all those pieces out. And they ended up snipping out this piece and titling the whole episode around this thing that I thought was kind of a minor part of our discussion, but it was, it was kind of interesting, all about rituals. And so as part of the conversation, I talked about this kind of formative experience around rituals. Uh, I, I don't know if you know who Bing Gordon is. I can uh, explain for some of your listeners as well. So, so uh, Bing, uh, the story starts with with Bing Gordon. Bing is a um, uh, fairly famous entrepreneur now. He's one of the founders of Electronic Arts. Uh, he's now a full time investor. You know, helped start Zynga on the board of Amazon. He's sort of well, very well connected. 
And he and I sat on a board together for, for a company in the video space. And he kept harassing the CEO about his list of golden rituals. He said, where's your list of golden rituals? And one day I sort of asked him, I said, what, what's, a, uh, what's a golden ritual? And uh, Bing's one of the best nonlinear thinkers on the planet. But he he's had uh, this interesting framework for he said, he said, well, uh, all great companies have a small list. <coughs> he said, all great companies have a small list of golden rituals. And there are three criteria. Number one, they're named. Number two, every employee knows them by their first Friday. And number three, they're templated. And the he rattled off his his list of examples. Amazon has six pagers. Google has OKRs. Salesforce does a thing called B2 Mom. But each of these companies has developed this golden ritual. They're named. Every employee knows them by their first Friday. And they are templated. So anyway, so I mentioned this to Reed as we were talking about how Coda operates. So I got this interesting thing from, from Bing Gordon. And the podcast editor sort of edited into the episode. And the episode went out, you know, like I assume this one will at some point. And I got all this inbound interest on, on rituals. And people said, you know, I love that I concept of rituals. And, hey, I have one. I, uh, you know, I'd love to learn more about that one that you shared. I have one I'd like to share. And this was right at the start of the pandemic. And so we're all kind of locked in our homes and trapped and trying to figure out what to do with our time. And, and I said, um, I had an idea. Uh, how about I get a group of you together and we'll just do a virtual dinner and um, talk about rituals. And virtual dinners were like a popular thing for a brief moment there. And so I get together and it was, I think, seven different people on this first dinner. And it was, you know, leaders from iconic companies, Slack, Pinterest, Snowflake, so on. And I got together. It was a very simple dinner. Everybody share one ritual. And it was amazing. But, you know, we went around. People shared openly um, lots of concept, but lots of detail and what the rituals they shared were. And I learned a bunch of things in this process. And what, one thing I learned is people are very willing to share rituals. Like we, there's lots of ways we operate as teams that we're like, oh, that's kind of a secret. We have this, this strategy I do. It's what, but rituals, for whatever reason, people want to broadcast them from the rooftops. Uh, second thing I learned is people really want to hear about rituals. And the everybody wanted to come back for the next dinner. Um, uh, and then the third thing I learned was that rituals have this interesting role to play in our company. So I ended up doing this dinner series many times. And this, this, this last observation came, you know, probably dinner number six or seven. I, over the course of the last two and a half years, I've, I've, I've now hosted over a thousand people for dinners of different types. And that's the, the heart of where this book is coming from. And one of them, you know, probably dinner six, seven, eight, something like that. Uh, Dharmesh Shah, he's the founder of HubSpot, gave me this really interesting way of thinking about it. So Dharmesh said, one of the reasons he's excited about rituals, he said, you know, as companies, we build two products. We build one for our customers, and then we build a different one for our employees. And the one we build for our employees, we often label that with names like culture. Um, mm -hmm. And when you ask somebody to describe their culture, they'll describe it through rituals. The rituals are the actualization of culture. They're the implementation of culture. And uh, in his view, the reason the concept is so important is that rituals are not just how your team operates and is more efficient or so on. It's the two-way mirror to, to your culture. And so I got really excited about that. Somewhere in this journey, somebody said, hey, you're, you should turn this into a series of blog posts. I said, oh, that's a pretty good idea. And then somebody else said, maybe you should actually turn it into a book. And I thought, how hard could that be? And uh, and so I signed up to write a book on the topic, which I'm I'm probably 80 percent done with the manuscript, but I'm also a year and a half late than I from what I thought I'd be. So but it's an enormously fun book to write. Fantastic. And some really there's going to be some incredible resource in there and ideas around uh, how people can build culture and and create a workplace that they that they know they're attracting people to. And so I know as well in the book, you've got a, a section in there around the intersection of communication and decisions that leaders make and the importance of, of thinking through these things in the modern workplace. Is, um, are you able to, to share any of those insights? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is actually the chapter I'm working on right now. So I'm still, I'm still framing. And my process in this is interview lots of people, get lots of ideas, and then find what are the common common themes. And so this analogy came 
from a trip I did. Um, so we went let's see, five years ago, 2018. We went on a family trip to Tanzania. Went on safari, and the we spent ten days, you know, sort of transported into this amazing new world. Have you been on a safari before? But I, if, the one thing I noticed is that it doesn't matter how many pe animals people saw or didn't see, safari yeah. is still the most magical experience for them. Yeah. Yeah. E easily top trip our family took and I highly recommend it. And, but one of the things that got recommended to me on the way there was they said, I, we like to, oftentimes the family will read a book on a trip. So we're like, you know, we went to Paris and we all read the, um, uh, the Da Vinci Code together and like, we, you know, all those like, you, you kind of like want to um, connect a little bit with the place you're in. So for this trip, we all read the book Sapiens, um, which is uh, Yuval Harris and, you know, fantastic history of, of humans. And the, and it just talks about the stages of how humanity evolved. And one of the most magical places in Tanzania is this place called the Ngorogoro Crater, and it's um, it's pretty high up. I think it's five thousand feet up or something. But it's a crater at the top of this this large mountain that is a uh, hundred square miles, and it has two hundred and fifty thousand animals in it. Um, and so there's like, and you kind of like you feel like you 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 go up this mountain, you go down the edge of this crater, and you feel like you're transported back in time to the beginning of this book, the beginning of Sapiens, uh, you know, 70,000 years ago. And one of the things he talks about is how humans were in the uh, the middle or even the bottom side of the food chain just 70,000 years ago. And, you know, there's like a fun anecdote in the book about, you know, how advantageous everybody thinks so advantageous that we have thumbs. And, you know, actually what thumbs were useful for then is, you know, the lions were at the top of the food chain and then the hyenas would come and eat whatever the lions didn't. And then the vulture would come and pick off everything. And then humans could come. And one of the reasons thumbs were so useful is we could get to bone marrow. So we could break bone. And so we were last with this, in this chain of things. But, you know, everything else about humans is kind of dumb. We're slow. We're like, you know, all these things. But one thing we, the big advantage we get is actually we have these, like, fairly large brains. And that allows us to communicate in very different ways. He talks about how every other species in history has taken uh, tens of millions of years to climb up the food chain sharks, lions, so on. Humans did it in 70,000 years. Why, how did we do it? We learned to talk to each other. And he, he's got, and it's a, so this chapter in the Rituals of Great Teens book is all about communication. It just starts with the anecdote. And he kind of walks through these three phases of humans talking to each other. And he starts with this phase he calls the gossip phase, which is like a very simple idea is humans can talk to each other. So why did, why did humans sort of shoot up this, this chain? And his, he uses this kind of provocative way of thinking about it uh, he says that humans could gossip in a way that others can, and he defines it. So, you know, we can talk to each other, like lots of animals can communicate, but we can do, we have imaginations in a way that other animals don't. So, for example, monkeys can signal to each other and say, hey, there's a lion by the river, don't go there. What a monkey can't say is, uh, give me give me five bananas now and I'll give you a hundred bananas tomorrow, or I'll give you a thousand bananas in the afterlife. Like these are all things that humans can transact on that that uh, other animals can't. And what that allows us to do is build much, much larger groups. It allows us to, you know, the, the Crusades were fought by a set of people that spoke completely different languages and all showed up with, you know, one point of agreement on how they viewed the afterlife to work. And that was enough for them to go and, you know, fight alongside each other. And so his view is that how we communicate is who we are. And that's what causes our species to be special. And communication has gone through these sort of three phases of, uh, of humanity. So one phase where we learned how to work together physically in one place. And that's, you know, we learned how to farm. We, we settled into cities. Like no, no other animal does that really in the same way that humans do. And the next phase happened um, uh, as we learned to talk to each other and we learned to uh, um, uh, communicate and language evolved and, and so on. And then the Gutenberg press was invented and we learned to write. Um, and in my mind, when you think about communication rituals at a company, they kind of follow the same pattern. And, you know, when we're setting up our rituals for our teams, when we think about communication, you can kind of think about the same three buckets. So the first thing we figure out is physically, how do we organize our people, right? And, you know, the most important version of that is, are we going to be distributed or not? 
Are you agreeing? You know, for a long time, it was, are we going to be offices or cubicles? Are we going to be, are we going to be in tall buildings or sprawled out campuses? And nowadays, when we think about physical choices we make, um, you know, the number one choice we make is, is, are we going to be in one place or distributed? And every, every CEO and executive team on the planet right now has a strong opinion on this topic. <laughs> you could possibly not. Um, and then the second choice we make is what I call the messaging choice, which is sort of how do we talk to each other? And, you know, there's a big change that happened when email came out. And, you know, at any one of our dinners, if I wanted to get a rise out of the group, I could throw the little the little topic I would throw in the middle is the email versus Slack topic. <laughs> hey, what is your what does your thing, team think about email versus Slack? And everybody had an opinion. And it's kind of remarkable to think about. Like, we've all lived with email for, you know, 40 or 50 years now without questioning its utility. And, and then this, you know, amazing company Slack came along and changed our view of like, oh, maybe the way we message each other should be a little bit more synchronous and should be a little bit more, um, you know, uh, sender driven than receiver driven. Email tends to be, you know, I can get your email and ignore it, but Slack is hard to ignore. Uh, it should be interruptive, which seems like crazy. Email is intentionally not interruptive. Like there's all these things that change in your culture when you're a Slack culture versus an email culture. And so it's as important a choice we make is are we going to be distributed or not is this choice on are we going to be slack or email and my view is the third choice people are now making is about the writing it's about their documentation and you know up till now we've assumed you know the first versions of the documents were all formed around physical analogs in the 1970s you know we we had a document that would replace a typewriter we had a spreadsheet that replaced a ledger from from a shopkeeper and we had um, presentations that replaced the professor's slides the transparencies um, and we've kind of lived with the, the, these, these three, you know, distinct metaphors for, for 50 years. And all of a sudden this is changing. I mean, products like Coda, we're not the only ones, but products like Coda are saying, Hey, we don't have to work that way anymore. And that's actually really important how, how we think about our documentation. You know, it's not just about communication. It's about outcomes. So how do you, how do you think about these tools in that way? Uh, you know, another another prompt I'll often hand people is, are you a presentation culture or a write-up culture? And it turns out to be like completely changes your company. You know, Nike, Apple, so on our, our deep presentation cultures, Amazon, uh, Google, deep writing cultures, totally changes how decisions are made, how the how the types of products you're created are made, um, you know, how you organize information. I call it the Yahoo culture or the Google culture. Like, do you try to cram everything into an organized wiki the way Yahoo did, you know, our hierarchical organization in the world? Or do you intentionally allow spread, get a lot of people to, to, to run things the way they want to run things and, and sort of help people get to the right place the way Google did? Um, and then, you know, maybe one other aspiration for documentation is, do you, do you, Embrace the idea that our documents are crossed in line into applications. You give you give your teams the tools to say, yeah, you don't have to buy the CRM app and the project management app and so on. We'll let you craft these documents and go go build your own way to do, like I was telling the YouTube story, to do performance mm -hmm. management, to do planning, to do you know uh, um, the way we do content moderation and, and so on. So, anyways, this 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 very interesting chapter of the book starts from Africa and humanity and this book sapiens and then sort of leads to that i think this kind of practical set of rituals of how have teams constructed their physical choices their messaging choices and their documentation choices so interesting it's really fascinating isn't it to think that we need to now be strategic about things that were previously you know was the decision Take for granted when everyone was yeah. in one place at one time the decision was made around these things and now now we're thinking about them too yeah that's right and you have rituals in Coda as well. You've you I don't know whether this coincided with writing the book. It sounds like actually you you started rituals at Coda right from the beginning. Is that right? Yeah. There's one I've heard about called Dory and Pulse. And when yeah. I think of Dory, I think of a friend of mine called Dory, and then I also think of Dory, the key character in Finding Nemo. Um, it's a ladder. Yeah, right. totally. <laughs> I don't know your friend, but she sounds wonderful. But <laughs> it is the character okay. finding Nemo. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So uh, so golden rituals. So back to Bing's three tasks, right? So Bing has three tasks for golden rituals. Um, they're named. Every employee knows them by their first Friday, and they're templated. Um, interestingly, I think almost every team I've spoken to has some set of rituals. Whether they kind of whether whether it's intentional or not is is different but something often emerges that makes this team 
kind of unique to that team and sticks. And, you know, you can catch it by just take the set of employees on the first Friday and just ask them, what is the golden riches? I was just talking to some, my friend just joined Walmart and it's like, so what are the golden riches of Walmart? And he talked about the Walmart cheer. And it's like, and it's a thing that, you know, you, you can't possibly, he said, you can't possibly work at Walmart and not know this cheer. It's just so, it's so different. It's a little bit iconic and, and so on. So if you were to ask a set of Coda employees on their first Friday, what our golden ritual is, 99 out of 100, you're going to get people telling you about Dory and Pulse. And just to describe what they are first. So Dory is um, the way we ask questions. So rather than raising our hands or blurting out questions at a meeting, we add them to this uh, table um, and you vote them up and down. And we go through them in order. Uh, the It's called Dory because it's named after the fish who asks all the questions. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we do it. I and mean, probably the most important is that it organizes our, our meeting times uh, to you know sort of go through the most important topics, but it has a bunch of other side benefits as well. Um, you know, it reduces the, the, uh, the hippo effect, you know, the highest paid person dominates the meeting. You know, it allows for the right ideas to put to the top, so on. And the second thing we do is called Pulse. And if, if Dory is about how we ask questions, Pulse is about how we make decisions. And so when we're ready to make a decision, we say, um, we give, a, a, it's a little widget in Coda. It looks like a table where everybody adds their view. And usually there's like a scale, like are you on board, one to five? And then there's a reason. And one of the key things about this is it hides everybody else until you're done writing. And so the, the core idea is remove the group think. Um, and, you know, we use it for everything. Should we launch this feature? Should we hire this person? Should we buy this company? Should we should we open an office? Should we, you know, whatever it is, Dory and Pulse. And, and you know, so if you ask the set of code employees on the first Friday, they would almost certainly talk about this ritual because they've probably seen it like 50 times. It'd be odd to come into a Coda document or meeting and not see a Dorian Pulse. It's just sort of built into our culture. But the reason they'd be excited about it isn't because they care about how meetings run. I mean, some people do. And, and uh, you know, I know we got introduced by Elise Keith and, you know, she and I are probably two of the people on the planet that think a lot about how meetings run. But the... Um, uh, but most of them won't talk about it because of that. They'll talk about it because of the, the culture. And I'll hear them talk to their friends about it. They'll say, oh, yeah, I joined this company. I just finished my first week. And they'll say, oh, how was it? And say, well, they do this really unique thing called Dory and Pulse. And they have this value that is great ideas can come from anywhere. And they really mean it because I was able to ask this question in this meeting and outvoted the CEO. And in this other place, I was able to offer an opinion that normally would have been drowned out by everybody else's. But it was thoughtfully constructed. And I actually got involved in the discussion and it affected the discussion. And, and I really felt like great ideas can come from anywhere. And that's, that's what our culture stands for. And so that's, that's our core golden ritual. But I think the thing to think, I mean, and we've seen many of our customers mimic it. It's a very popular thing that people do in Coda. So we'll see lots of Dorian Pulse, although each one of them has a little twist on it. You know, the, 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 I saw the Coinbase team do it a little bit differently than we did it. And actually I borrowed some of that and brought it back into Coda. And, and so, so they, each one is a little bit different, but the, the core, but it's a good idea. It's a good example of a ritual that meets all three tests. It's named every employee knows them by their first Friday and it's, it's templated. And I love as well that people are volunteering to talk about it. It's having a great impact. It's a, a key symbol that's shaping your culture. And that's right. The other people who'd want to, to do that. Um, so there's some quite specific mechanics around the documents that you're using to make all of those opinions anonymous, for example, in the polls. Mm -hmm. And yeah. tap into the wisdom of the crowds that way. Um, how would people access a, that document, or um, is, is that one of the, the functions of Coda? You know, completely naive yeah. question. But how does it work mechanically? Um, yeah. So, so first of all, if you if you go to Coda, Coda looks like a, a document, blinking cursor, blank screen. You know, if you know how to use a Google Doc or Word Doc or so on, you'll feel completely at home. Now, there's a lot of depth under that surface and there's building blocks where you can do all sorts of things and our users will tell you you can make a doc as powerful as an app um, but it sort of starts off as a, a, a blinking cursor and there's a series of templates you can access them by hitting slash and you can get a template for anything so you know, i want a task tracker i want a way to uh do a project plan or so on and many of these we've built in as as uh baked in templates if you do slash dory you'll get a dory and slash pulse you'll get a pulse um, probably more interestingly, you can add your own rituals and turn them into templates. And so you can extend this for your team and say, oh, I want to make, 
decisions this way. And this is going to be our toolkit for doing it. And you make a slash command. And now everybody in the company has this ability to shift their ritual into, into that, into that surface as, uh, as well. Nice. Um, but yeah, that's how you get to it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I think there'll be people who want to, to go and have a look. Uh, I certainly do. And, um, mm. and I, so I'm also keen to tap into your views on AI because you're, you're working really at the cutting edge of technology that's changing the way that we work. Um, mm -hmm. so what's your, and uh, just, in, um, I guess it's a it's a fairly um, kind of open chat at this point because I yeah. we're gonna with it, where could, we could go in a million different directions. Today. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Do you have a, a view on how AI is going to to shape and change the way that we work going forward? <clears throat> Lots of views. I mean, I think I think that the um, first off, I, I, it's such an interesting point in in history in the arc of this technology you know i've been in the computer science industry for a long time my father was a professor he's now at nasa runs the supercomputing division there and and so i've watched ai evolve and actually he used to joke with me that ai is the label we put on things um that don't work like the moment it works it's not ai um and so like you know there's all sorts of things that the like the example he would give is you you, you pull up to a stoplight and it turns red or green based on you know how long you've been there and the other cars and so on. Is that AI? It's like, no, it's not. It's a sensor. There's a little algorithm. Like that's not AI. And so, so one of the interesting things is it's taken a while for AI to achieve this kind of interesting bar of being interesting and still magical. Like we've been gradually taking things out of AI. And and um, and at YouTube, you know, we ran many machine learning systems. I mean, there's you know, the way that obviously the way the search engine works, the way the recommendation system works, but even little things, the way we generated thumbnails, the way we generated transcripts for every video, like these, you know, at one point I counted a hundred distinct machine learning systems that were running, uh, running YouTube. So in some senses, we've all been living with AI around us and taking it for granted and not really labeling it AI because it just seems like the way it works, right? Mm. So what changed right now is, I think we took AI from being something that was built for developers to all of a sudden we exposed it. And it's almost like we took the hood off and we kind of gave everybody their own screwdriver and said, you can go look at it. You can actually, and I think chat GPT, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of credit given to the model and so on, but I actually think the biggest credit is to the user experience. Like it all of a sudden put people front and center with the technology that we'd all been working on behind the scenes, it already does amazing things. And the fact that we can like search for anything on the internet and we get back an answer in in just a you know 100 milliseconds, it's like crazy. But we don't call that AI; we call that Google. And so it's like, well, there was something that flipped when we could chat with it that a lot like allowed us to to feel differently about it. So I think that's really magical, um, and it's an enormous step forward. I mean, I don't think. I've watched some pretty big step changes in technology. I mean, the change to mobile, the change to cloud, like these are all pretty big changes. I mean, even the mobile one, if I think was like, we feel like that happened overnight. Um, but actually like the first mobile phones were created in the late nineties. Like the iPhone didn't come out to 2005. Like, you know, long, long periods. In the, and the actually my own team at YouTube didn't produce a mobile app till a couple of years later. We didn't take it back from Apple until a few years after that. Like there's a, you know, there's the, on the other hand with AI, the entire world just turned on a dime. Like every everybody saw it and has has switched, and it's just so exciting. I mean, it's like the and I think a lot of it is because we just got a, a peek at this thing we used to label as as once it works, it's not AI. The um, so at Coda, we've been we've been building uh, our AI capability, and I think it's given me a couple unique views on what's going to happen with with AI. And if you just go to Coda.io slash AI, you'll see this this. Uh, great sort of future video of what where we're headed with with this. And and we've launched a bit of it to in beta to some of our early users. And so you can try it out as well. But I think this I, I think there's sort of two primary observations I'd have about AI that I think people may find interesting. So the first one is <coughs> the line between what I call writing assistance and work assistance. Mm -hmm. So some of what's happening with AI, um, if we think about the documents we we write in. One of the things we all take for granted is the red squigglies that show up under words. Right? That spell check. You know, is that AI? No, 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 that's not AI. It's, it's a dictionary. It's like obvious how that works. So on. But it's like it's a little piece of AI. And one of the things that's happening in basically every document surface in the world is 
uh, we kind of up leveled spell check to be a writing assistant. And you can certainly do it in Coda. There's other services you can do it in as well, where you can come in and say things like, you know, finish the sentence for me, uh, write this post for me, uh, edit this for me, make it shorter, make it funnier, turn it into a poem. A lot of people have been having fun turning things into rap songs. Not sure that's highly, uh, high, you know, high utility, but it's definitely that's fun. Very entertaining. <laughs> I want to try but, it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is. It is right. Write yourself a fun rap song for for yourself or a friend or or so on. It's, it's it is very entertaining. The um, uh, but I think the really and I think that is us like kind of getting to play with a new toy. Um, mm -hmm. but I think. One thing we talk a lot about at Coda is the line, the the next leap of that, which we call is going from writing assistants to work assistants, and actually having this help me do things. Um, and I think that our expectations of AI are about to increase substantially. So we thought ChatGPT was a big deal. We're about to see the next level. So as easy examples, uh, you know, in Coda, we've seen people. You can uh, a common example is. Uh, you build a table with all your meetings in it. You add a column for meeting notes. You start taking meeting notes in it. And you add right next to it, add a column that says, can you summarize these for me? Yeah, another one says, can I take can you take the action items out? Take another one says, can you draft the follow-up email? And because Coda has building blocks that allow you to connect to any other system, you add another one that says, send this email out to everybody who is there. And like all of a sudden, you went from these meeting notes that went nowhere to something actionable for everybody, everybody in the group. Um, there's an incredibly long tail of examples. One of my favorite ones that came from our community recently was there's a group of teachers that um, elementary school teachers and middle school teachers that uh, discovered that they could write report card feedback this way. Turns out it's like actually really time consuming to go through. You know, you have three classes of 30 kids each and you got to write report cards for each one. And it's kind of hard to come up with something creative for each one. And so what they did is they made, you know, a table full of students. And for each one, they labeled a couple characteristics and said like, oh, this person's funny and this person's a little bit mischievous and this person's really studious and this person needs to open up a little bit more or so on. But, you know, write four or five words or so on, you know, put the grades in there and, and, uh, and say, generate a paragraph for me. And out popped this paragraph they could paste in the report card and off they went. And it's like, you know, what used to take them literally a week all of a sudden happened fast and saved them a bunch of time. You know, the other thing it allows them to do is do it more often. Like now they can go and, you know, what does every parent want to know? How's my kid doing? Right? And well, I'll tell you, a report card time is an unsatisfying answer to, to, to any parent. And so I think this idea of moving from writing assistant to work assistant is, is really interesting. The other thing I think is interesting about what's going to come next with AI is I feel like the seesaw tilted. So we went from AI being a tool for developers. I mean, it's, yeah, this is lots of, we've been hiring machine learning experts for two decades now. You know, we've been running this big system and so on. ChatGPT tilted it all the way to users and mm -hmm. said, you know, my daughter has a friend who spends all day long talking to Snap AI. It's become his new best friend. <laughs> the, you know, they're all kind of worried about him. <laughs> the, uh, um, but it kind of slipped it all the way to users. And I think the you know the interesting spot for the pendulum is probably in the middle of what we call makers, and makers are are you know that's a term we use a lot at at Coda. Uh, that's that's how we personify the person we serve is a doc made for makers. And our our view of it is that there's these people that you know are in every team or in every uh, company, workplace, family, school, so on, and they're the people that take action on the world around them, and then the. Uh, in the YouTube world, we thought of makers as creators. They, they went and broadcast themselves to the world. In the workplace or in home, we, we call these the makers. They're the person who, you know, every family has a person who plans a camping trip. Every workplace is the person who sets up the task tracker. You know, uh, there's the waitress in the restaurant that gets frustrated that nobody shows up to the shifts on time and makes the shift chart for everybody in a clear way that actually allows her to, to come when she wants to come. The And I think that person has been lacking the right tool. And that's certainly CODA's mission is to be the blinking cursor of choice for the next billion makers. But the 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 way we think about that, what AI does for that person is gives that person an extra assistant, gives it an extra superpower, an extra building block that they can do totally imaginative things with. And I think that we're going to see people create with AI in ways that we used to only see developers create. And we're going to see what we think of as the normal people around us 
go and solve problems that were really hard to solve before. And so I'm, I'm really excited about it, but there right. may be a couple of the ways I'm thinking about AI. I'm really um, captivated by that idea that Coder is for makers and that it takes that blinking cursor, that, that blank page, which, which I think uh, in some ways maybe we've been educated out of thinking like that in some, in some jobs, in some sectors, where people have, you know, are quite used to working to a set of rules instead. But instead now there's, you know, potentially opportunity to, to do all the things that were very rules-based much more quickly and actually to have, have a bit more time to, to think, in a, think and look at a blank space. So, yeah, I think that's, um, you know, maybe a bit of a, a philosophical uh, kind of reflection, but, but yeah, it's, it's a really exciting tool to be enabling that. That's, that's very cool. Yeah. Today, really awesome to be getting to know you through, um, through your experiences and, and, and um, understanding you as a leader and, and how code is working. And I've just got one last question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Our audience can just get to know you just that little bit more. And that is, um, is there anything that you really like to eat or cook? And what's your favorite meal? Um. <laughs> What, is it? what an interesting question. So um, my, my wife is, I, I used to cook more. My wife is an amazing cook. And you and I think in most families, you find your lane. <laughs> she's, uh, she's really good at it. Um, yeah, that's right. She's, Let's keep it that she's way. actually famous. Yeah, she's famous for her cakes. So she makes these amazing cakes. If you go search for Anjali Marosa on Pinterest, you'll find these, uh, these remarkable, I mean, she's made cake that looks like you know, uh, looks like a car. She's like very, very regularly, wow. regularly asked by our friends and family to make these. But one thing we do as a family is every time we take a trip, we read a book as we talked about, but we also take a cooking class wherever we go, which is like kind of a fun family ritual we do. And so, uh, see, recently we went to Paris and learned how to make uh, croissants. And uh, that's a amazing process. Very um, yeah, the amount of detail that goes into that and, you know, the precision and, you know, of course it's in, in France. So it's, uh, there's all sorts of rules. Like it's not a croissant unless you do this, unless, yeah. you know, if you use this kind of butter, then it doesn't count. If you don't, then it does. <laughs> and I, I, it's very interesting, like who set these rules, right? And, uh, you know, the, you know, back to the list of things from sapiens that only humans can do. <laughs> we can set rules on what is a croissant. And then uh, most recently, uh, over the last over spring break, we went to Japan, and the whole family loves uh, sushi, and so we took a class on how to make sushi. And I, I have to say, I thought going in, like, how hard is it to make sushi? Like, it seems like the relatively easy part of it, and it was amazing. I mean, it's a, you know, I think the a lot of analogies actually to the level of French precision and. You, know, you use this knife for this, and you use this knife for that. Here's exactly what you cut. Here's how you serve this one. This is the order. This is the you know how the rice is made, how how they make tamago. How they, it was just amazing. And so, I mean, I love the the precision of it, the art of it, the the creativity within constraints. You know, so I I uh, I am generally more of a eater than a cooker, except when we're on vacation and we're in these in these uh, uh, these situations. So. Love it. And is there anything else that you wanted to leave our listeners with on the workplace, the future of the modern workplace or leadership? Yeah, maybe, maybe one last thing is, um, uh, so certainly if anybody has questions, opinions, thoughts on Coda, go to Coda.io and feel free to let us know what you think about it. Um, this book I'm writing, Rituals of Great Teams, I decided to write it in the open and uh, with a with an open brain trust. So if you search for Shashir Rituals Brain Trust, you'll find you'll find uh, uh, a sign up to join my brain trust and help me write the book. And so I've got actually at this point over a thousand people have been co-editing the book with me, which is really fun. It's kind of appropriate for a book that's all about collecting contributions. And so if you want to join in and, you know, I'll promise you a, a copy of the book when it's ready in return for your contributions and, and, uh, and help in making the book great. So um, help me write a fun book. And presumably it's a good way to try out Coda. And it's a good way to try out Coda, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ashir. Fantastic to have you on the show. All right. Thanks, Nina. Thanks.